Hi, I'm Nora Young. Living better has always been the ultimate promise of technology. Think of all those atomic age, better living through chemistry cliches, smoother, faster, brighter, labor-saving, efficient. It's mid-century pop culture camp, of course, but that drive for living better applies to the history of our technologies as well. We usually equate technology with a new technology. In the early going, we see it for what it is, the tools and techniques we invent to help us achieve a desired outcome, generally living better, at least for some people. We think of it as technology when we see the change it makes in our lives. After that, it just becomes life. An e-book, say, is a technology. A paper book is not, except, of course, that it is. So if living better has always been the promise and the premise of technology, what went wrong? According to a recent poll, 56% of Canadians say the big technology companies are making society a worse place. We openly talk about a tech lash. Where's my robot made indeed? When people think of big technology companies, they're probably thinking about the global titans we see as technology that touch us day to day, Facebook, Twitter, Amazon, Google, our smartphones maybe. They're probably not thinking about companies that make nuclear reactors or Siemens, though those too are big technology companies. So let's narrow in on those big tech companies like Facebook, Google, et al. What went wrong that we perceive these technologies as making us anxious about our privacy, not solving social isolation in spite of connectivity, divided by disinformation and hyperpartisan information, and distracted. We might point to some contingent problems in the way these technologies evolved. One, they're data-driven, which is their great strength, especially in connecting us to information and people relevant to us. But it's also problematic in terms of the click, I agree, nature of data stewardship. Data then is weaponized due to advertising as the dominant business model, which as many people have pointed out, means repeated, even compulsive engagement is the goal. Because so many of those big technology companies are social technologies, and we're deeply social creatures, that need for connection will drive us to the point of distraction, compulsion, and toxic behavior. Scalability is a business goal. The focus is on building technologies that don't just serve an interest in living better, but that have to scale to astonishing user bases. This is undergirded by venture capital funding that stresses hockey stick growth. And there's scale as technological reality. We're experiencing something historically completely new, where companies go from startups in metaphorical garages to globe-spanning titans with millions or billions of users. From an innovation point of view, that astonishing scale makes it exceedingly difficult to plan for how users will adapt and use the technology differently all over the world in a range of cultural and economic contexts. These problems are well documented by critical voices in tech, and they have brought us to where we are now. But underneath these problems, are there challenges with the very culture and structure of innovation? Problems which are more visible and acute now precisely because of the issues I just pointed to. Perhaps we may be at the limits of one of the main premises of engineering and technology, that optimization is always a good. A hat tip here to my Spark colleague Adam Killick for raising this question about the limits of optimization the other day. In his excellent book, Coders, tech journalist Clive Thompson describes the cult of efficiency in coder culture. The problem, as he put it on Spark, is that, quote, every time you optimize something, there are some great positive effects that you intended and there's almost always some weird, unexpected negative effects that you didn't even think about. The cultural critic Chris Gilliard points out the connection between social isolation and friction-free technology, such as apps that let us get food delivered without having to talk to someone, never mind going out to a restaurant to be around other people. Is it any wonder optimization is tied to socialization? After all, society is often not very efficient. Then there's the belief that technologists can control for everything, when the history of any technology shows us that users have an important role to play in how the technology turns out. Famously, product designer Chris Messina invented the hashtag for Twitter. Today, a global community of users shapes the direction and must be factored into design from the get-go. And crucially, there's the belief that technology is neutral. In reality, technology is always already embedded in social, economic, and political contexts. So we can't develop a technology 
and then think about the politics and the power in the application of the technology because they're braided through from the very beginning, power, politics, and technology. So where does that leave us if technology is to live up to its living better promise? One, the unfettered model of innovation is fundamentally broken because of this environment of global scale and complexity. We need interdisciplinary, diverse teams from the get-go. We need design of technology that recognizes the limits of technological control. That is not just a failure of imagination not to be able to predict how technologies will be used. It's inherent in the nature of technology. We got here by not understanding the political and social aspects of technology and innovation. However, since we're not likely to solve the problem of innovation culture this evening, what do we do as individuals to live better with our social technologies? Well, I would say make friends with the idea that frictionless and efficient isn't better all the time. As social animals, optimization can be suboptimal when it separates us from others. And to return to the start of my seven minutes and what we consider a technology, hold that technology at the moment where you see what's gained and lost for yourself. So not not using social media, say, but holding it at the place where you still know what it's like not to be in the realm of likes and follows. Have a stance towards those big technology companies that allows you to be on them, but not of them to retain your own critical distance, your own deeply human, non-technological ability to connect with other people. Thank you.